world would feel like the same way. If not for a marriage not be, we would not have this wonderful exhibition um, surrounding us today. The annual exhibition of contemporary art is one of several important legacies um, that Louise Jordan Smith started. Smith was one of the first five resident professors when the college opened as Randolph Macon College in 1891. And in 1900, she declared, I want an annual exhibition. This exhibition must contain only the best artwork that is done anywhere. It should be understood that each year the best pictures should be purchased for a permanent collection. If the history of our nation may be foreseen by the light which other nations give us, we may know that our influence will last longest through our art. The first annual exhibition was installed in 1911. On the occasion of the 80th annual exhibition, Friends and Family of Helen Clark Berlin, class of 1958, established a symposium in her honor which would expand and extend the educational impact of the exhibition. This year's symposium is also supported in part by three of our members, Kitty Caldwell, class of 1974, Julie McGowan, class of 1969, and Allison Muller, class of 1971. And we do ask you, if you're not a member already, to consider becoming one and to help us with our uh, exhibitions and programming um, to uh, help us enable us to do things like uh, the symposium that we're enjoying. Um, I would like to turn over the program now to Laura McManus, our Curator of Education, who will moderate the panel discussion. Thanks for coming. Sharon Horvath. Sharon was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1958. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from Cooper Union, New York, and her Master of Fine Arts from the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. She is currently an Associate Professor of Art at Purchase College, SUNY. Her work has been exhibited in numerous galleries and institutions, including the American Academy of Arts and Letters in New York and the American Academy in Rome, Italy. She has received numerous awards, and so I'm just going to point out a few, which include uh, most recently a Fulbright Research Fellowship to travel to India, 2014, which I think she'll talk a little bit about today. And um, she also received the Pollock Krasner Foundation grant for painting two times in 1993 and 1997. And then next uh, to my right, sitting in the middle, is Judith Schechter, who is a stained glass artist. She actually started as a painter, but then she quickly moved to stained glass. Um, Judith was born in 1961 and grew up in Newton, is that, am I pronouncing that correctly, Massachusetts? Okay. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Rhode Island School of Design in 1983 and then went on to teach at the Pilchuck Glass School in Seattle, the Toyoma Institute of Glass in Japan, the Pennsylvania Academy, the New York Academy of Art, the Rhode Island School of Design. She currently teaches at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, where she lives. She is also the recipient of many grants, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships and Crafts, 
the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award, the Joan Mitchell Award, two Pennsylvania Council on the Arts Awards, the Pew Fellowship in the Arts, and a Leeway Foundation grant. Her work is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Hermitage in Russia, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Corning Museum of Glass, the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian Institute, and numerous other private and public collections. And then last but not least, we have Barbara Tekabaga. And uh, Barbara was born in, um, I have here 1994. I love that. <laughs> I know. Did I, did, I say, did I say that earlier? Corrected, just keep going. Wow. her time between New York and um, Williamstown, Massachusetts. She is the Mary A. and William Wirt Warren Professor of Art at Williams College, a position that you've held well before your, your birth in 1985. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Barbara's work has, uh, wide, has been widely exhibited uh, at institutions including Mass Mocha, uh, which is in North Adams, Massachusetts, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, the National Academy Museum in New York, Asia Arts Initiative in Philadelphia, and the International Print Center. She is also the recipient of many, many awards, which you can read about in your bios. So thank you all for, for being here, and we have just an illustrious panel, and I'm, I'm very happy to share this. this you seem so far away, but I'm happy, I'm happy to share the stage with you. All right, so um, what I've done is I have prepared a, a series of questions, which I will eventually get to after all my paperwork. Um, I hope it's a nice mixture of questions that will provide uh, our panelists an opportunity to speak to their influences, their process, point of view, and, and then I'm hoping we can also de dig a little deeper into, into some larger questions that get at the heart of this exhibition. And so with that in mind, we are going to begin large with a big question. Um, and just to uh, lay the groundwork a little bit, museums allow opportunities for visitors to engage deeply with individual works of art and on an individual level, to develop meaning for themselves based on the experiences they bring with them. There's a dialogue that happens between the artist and the work of art and the visitor. And I love that. That's what I love about my job, is that dialogue. And how that conversation goes is dependent on a lot of variables, what the visitors bring with them, their own set um, you know, ideas, their mood for the day, a lot of variables. One variable place that is, one variable that's typically in place is that a work of art is displayed within the context of an exhibition that has been curated with a particular narrative or lens in mind. And so here we are in the Thorson Gallery at the Mayer Museum of Art at Randolph College. And the title and framing device for this exhibition is Threatening Beauty. Martha Johnson, our director and the curator for the exhibition, has described the curatorial focus for this exhibition as, quote, a collection of artists working in a variety of media who explore the tension between beauty and unrest, between the sublime and the sinister. So my question for each of you is, how do you see your work fitting into the theme for this exhibition, or does it? And if not, well then, maybe we can all just go home. Whoever wants to jump in and start. Your work is beautiful. I'll start. So Judith is going to start. Well, because I have an answer. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've been teaching at University of the Arts since, I don't know, 1993, before Barbara was born. Um, <laughs> and um, for a long time, my uh, teaching partner, because he metalsmith and jeweler Sharon Church and I, uh, would teach a project called Beauty. And in the course of this, we did this for maybe on and off for over 10 years. And 
I, the, the first time we presented, basically we had them do some project based responding to the idea of beauty, but we had to say something, you know, lectury ahead of time. And I, I came to understand how important beauty was to me. I, I'm not going to give away too many spoilers because I'm going to actually talk very directly about beauty when I talk about my work a little later. But I was, <clears throat> I realized that it was very, very important to me. And my first lectures were something like, beauty, it's really important, don't you just love it, kind of thing. So, and then I understood that like Immanuel Kant said something about beauty, and then I thought, oh God, do I actually have to read that to be responsible? That's going to be a problem. But <clears throat> I, I haven't read Immanuel Kant, but I've read everything but, and I've read all the captions on Wikipedia. So I, <clears throat> I've thought about beauty, and consciously I believe that I aim to make beautiful work. I don't think, you know, that sounds so arrogant. I don't go in my studio and go like, yeah, can't wait to make some more of my beautiful artwork. It doesn't feel like that at all. In fact, most of my process involves giving up that idea and just making anything, because art making is so hard. But beauty as, as an ideal in art matters to me, and I'm interested, very, very interested in how it came to be um, less so. So I guess I thought I was included in the exhibition because maybe you knew that about me, but that's so insane. Uh, <laughs> it's just a lucky coincidence. That's the end of me talking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we just did our research. <laughs> And you're welcome to just hold them. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, hmm. You know, you gave us those questions beforehand, mm -hmm. and I don't. Uh, you know, I don't. Uh, Sharon and I were talking earlier. I don't actually use that word very often, and I don't think about it in terms of my work. And people have told me that they they find beauty in the work, but it's not what I'm trying to go for. And um, it, it's odd because I actually think of myself as an abstract painter, even though they're very associative and pictorial. So, uh, you know, there are things that get depicted that are that have an element of beauty or an element of um, upliftingness or whatever. Um, I don't want to use the S word. Um, uh, sublime. You know, I, but I, I, I don't actually. I'm not aiming toward that and I'm always a little um, kind of surprised that it's uh, that they are viewed that way. Um, I think I'm if if I had my choice I would rather go on the threatening side, but that doesn't seem to be where they end up. Somehow the associations um, don't go there. So that if you are seeking beauty, you might be better off trying to paint the truth. And if you want to paint the truth, you're probably better off seeking beauty, if that makes any sense. That's just thought that I thought. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on what you just said, Sharon, about you think beauty is sleeping. That's what you said, right? Um, because I think that does get to uh, another focus of this exhibition, another another um, approach uh, that Martha was, is taking with this. Um, so, and, and it, uh, clearly defining beauty is difficult. That's not something you can't even put words around it sometimes, right? But um, nonetheless, I am going to ask you to use some words to uh, respond to uh, some other words. Um, 
So in the opening to the uh, exhibition notes, which are in the catalog, Martha Johnson quotes American singer-songwriter Phil Oakes, known for his political activism in the 60s. You can Google him if you're not sure who the heck I'm talking about. He described himself as a singing journalist, building songs from newspaper articles, from Newsweek articles. In the liner notes to his 1967 album, Pleasures of the Harbor, he wrote, quote, in such an ugly time, the true protest is beauty. So I'm wondering if that quote resonates with any of you, and if so, how? And then a secondary question is, what role do you feel that art plays in society? <laughs> so we'll, all just, we'll all just sit on that for a moment, and then um, you can respond. I'll read the quote again. <laughs> In such ugly times, the true protest is beauty. When was that quote? 1967. Important. Important year. Look, if you just are going to not talk, I'm going to talk. I'm going to be the Clarence Thomas. <laughs> the Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> first of all, I think that quote is very, uh, from a historical point of view, it's interesting coming in the mid 20th century when the project of modernist art to pretty much eradicate beauty from the uh, lexicon of uh, art artiness was in full swing. So that is a, it's a radical comment at that time. And uh, it's almost shocking. But I, I think it's a, absolutely a, a beautiful thing to say. And it gets back to what I was just saying about the relationship of beauty to the truth. Because I think, and I will talk about this a little bit later, I think that one of the reasons beauty became so disparaged was because of mass media access to war photos. And the idea of beauty being truth became an insult because the truth was so ugly at the time. And for someone to stand up for uh, an experience that might be considered, um, well, it's easier for a singer to talk about beauty maybe because that's um, disseminated in the mass culture better than fine arts, which tends to be uh, in museums and uh, not all over the place. Uh, so that can get confused with fiddling while Rome burns and luxury objects. So, but I think that the impact of beauty is not prettiness. There's a big difference, people. Uh, is really important in changing hearts and minds and the reason why people choose to live rather than to give up. So it might not always, one thing about visual art is that I think it tends to work very intimately with individuals as opposed to, um, you know, raising the crowd for political purposes. Um, so it works on people one at a time. And the fact that someone would choose to recognize the importance of that is very um, life affirming, I think. That was good. I, um, <laughs> that, was very, that was very good. Because I, I think, you know, I was trying to um, figure out why it is I don't think of that word or why it, it, it's not present um, in my particular art making. And I, I think because of what you were saying in a way, it, um, there is the, the sort of general notion in art of what that is. And that, you know, you said, is not prettiness. I think, um, you know, they're definitely, on my part at least, there's wanting to shy away from that. But um, I think it's for me that it's such a slippery thing, beauty, right? Um, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder and all that, and I just, I think um, somehow in, in my head there, there are substitutions for the word. Um, just because it's easier, but it's a very slippery kind of thing. I was thinking about how um, apparent, you know, apparently for us as primates, um, be 
beauty uh, of my friend Susanna Coffey, who's a portrait painter. Um, you know, she talks a lot about the symmetry of, of your features and that that is really what we what we go with as beauty in, in faces. And um, so in a way, it's not so much about the archetype or the, you know, the whatever, the, you know, the skin or the hair, which all, you know, all those things that we think about. But when it comes down to that kind of formal thing about the symmetry, then what does that mean in terms of you know, painting so, uh, or making compositions or something? So I'm, I'm not um, really coherent here, but there's something about I guess, I guess for me, I just want to point out the slipperiness of the term itself that makes it, for me, tricky. I think he was talking about man-made beauty. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I make a distinction between natural beauty and beauty and art. And beauty and art seems definitely culturally determined, and that's the slipperiness of it and um, politically I never thought that paintings could change the world. They might reflect it. Artists can change the world politically. But I think the beauty of artwork is tied up with its passivity in a way, the the necessity for the viewer to meet in that way. And um, on a on another level than the political I love what he's talking about. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I'm not sure what kind of beauty he was referring to. I think he might have been talking about awe-inspiring natural beauty. Yeah, and I and I'm wondering if he was talking about in times such in in those times, 67, and all of the ugliness of the world. Let's not forget the contrasting experience of beauty, however one defines that, whether it be natural beauty or man-made beauty, that, that it's times like these that we need to be reminded of beauty, however it's defined, and to present beauty, however that is, as a sign of protest in the sense of we don't have to live in this ugliness. Well, I think as humans, we're programmed to see the natural world as beautiful. The sun is universally beautiful. I think it's notable that in the presidential debates, for instance, the climate change, the earth itself wasn't discussed. And so people that are addressing those issues are protesting, and it's a protest for in the, the most important, <coughs> simple, I mean, the most important kind of beauty that there is, the beauty that sustains life. So I, I feel like beauty in art, I, I, like Barbara, I don't think of it in my studio. I feel like it's a, it's a byproduct or a, an afterthought, and it's very culturally determined. So um, materials are natural, Manipulated, and if they can um, get to the level of um, having an objecthood that seems real, I'm not sure if that's the truth, but a, a kind of reality that um, makes a space for itself in the world, that feels important. That feels like um, artists making a space, opening a space for the human imagination. Well, let's shift gears and, and talk about that process of artists, all of you, making work. Um, you talked a little bit about it this morning, uh, Barbara and Sharon, but I do want to, um, for those that weren't here, I want, I want you to have a chance to, to talk a little bit more about that. Because the three of you share, um, I'll use the word meditative, although I, I remember you saying that that's not that's not exactly the way you would describe it, but a meditative relationship to to your process um, in your studio and with your work. So, um, Barbara, there there's a compulsiveness to your work. Um, 
an obsessive nature. I mean, when you when you look at it, it, it there does seem to be. As a viewer, I've I've heard. You know, I've, I've taken several people, several students on tours, young younger students and and older and and older adults who all sort of have a takeaway of. Well, she must be really obsessive about dots. <laughs> she really loves dots. You know, saying things, something like that, right? So there's this obsessive nature to your mark making, and um, you've stated that through your work you are marking time, slowing it down, and that early in your process you play the Zen sur surrealist. So if you could explain a little bit about that aspect of your process, and then I'll ask the the other two panelists for other questions about their process. Um, okay, there, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. So, um, first of all, I, I'm mildly obsessive compulsive. Um, <laughs> um, I'm one of those people that um, I have to check the door three times. You know, I feel like the Leonard on the Big Bang Theory, you know, he just knocks three times. I have to check it three times and then I'll go down the stairs and then I go back up and I check it. So I, I have some of that. But I'm not um, I'm not straightening the fringe on the carpet or anything yet, and um, <laughs> yes. I, I feel like it's a, it's partly a, a so it's a tinge of just whoever I am that translates into the process. And it's, as I said this morning, it's very comforting to me. Um, that's the best part. Like I like thinking of what the image is, and it's all jazzy and great, and it's that's you know the creative part, but then it's like, okay, you have three weeks of making yellow dots or something, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, can't wait. And so I, I do um, sort of love that. Um, uh, the, um, the other thing is sort of related a little bit to the earlier question you had is, um, I used to say, in a talk, I used to say that um, I was kind of uh, vaguely Marxist in that, oh, that that you know that I was keeping society safe by making art because I you know, not becoming a serial killer or something. <laughs> but this this thing that I mean, and I I laughingly say Zen surrealist, but it, it is that. Um, if you were in the, this morning, I was talking about my process where I've I've weirdly taken on um, things that I don't that I actually never would want to be considered. And one of them is a surrealist or a um, landscape painter. But but um, but my process is now to, to sort of invite randomness by pouring and playing paint in a pseudo abex way, and then um, and then sitting and looking at it and waiting for the painting to tell me what it wants to be, and hence the patient Zen approach. Yeah. Uh, Judith, you're next. Um, because you have said that you take pleasure in the labor-intensive and task-oriented nature of working with glass, and that um, you move from painting to glass work, and that, uh, quote, the tedium factor and the variety of processes allowed me to focus on focus and concentrate. By the time I managed to do something to the glass, I had developed feelings of attachment. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. Barbara is my new hero. I'm going to do imitate you from now on because uh, <clears throat> I think you get into a state of flow with your work. You know where you where you're. Um, I don't know if it would be a Zen state or not. I've never experienced anything like that as far as I know. Um, so, but, but I love it when I'm in that state of doing repetitious OCD kind of work where, where you are um, in the zone of some sort or another. And I, feel, I feel like there's a joke in this. Like, do you like covering your hands with glue and peeling it off? Then you might be a glass artist. Do you, do you like picking at your belly button lint or pulling your fingernails off? This is the kind of thing I would be doing, or you know, hijacking cars. I don't know. Uh, I I think that I have undiagnosed ADD, uh, as does my dad. We have a good man on ADD. Can you have both at the same time? 
Um, I think, I, in my old artist statement, it says that I liked glass because I felt in sync with it. I will tell you that every single time I've ever uh, had something that felt like what might pass for an idea, and I am very, you guys are suspicious of the word beauty, I'm deeply suspicious of the word idea. I have no idea what an idea is. I've never had one. <laughs> but when I had something that seemed like a good starting place, something that might bear a lot of fruit, I really wanted to, like, you know, work it. And I will say, I'm not showing you the project I'm working on now, but I just want it to last forever because I'm totally convinced that everyone is the last one. And so I put in a lot of details because the more details there are, the longer it will take and the less chance it will be that I will live to start another one. I hate starting pieces. So I just want each one to last forever. So. Yeah, I, I, love, I love being there. But it's not like Zen meditation if Zen meditation involves serenity and peace. It's, <laughs> it's more like wrestling. <laughs> but you know what's nice about that is your question about um, stretching out time, because I think you answered that really nicely. You know, the, the, um, that that, that uh, attention kind of pulls things out and not only um, are you stretching it out in terms of what you're doing, but, you know, being in that kind of moment, um, I think there is that sort of weird delay that gets involved. Well, if Zen has something to do with being in the moment, then yes, it is like that. I don't know from Zen, so I'm not yeah. you know, talking. It sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> and Sharon, the best Buddhists don't know that they're Buddhists. Uh, <laughs> yes! <laughs> so I think maybe all of the other, like, I'm not sure. Sharon, if you just want to comment on the blind drawings, because you spent you spent a lot of time in a car or in transport going between Queens and Brooklyn and Purchase, New York. And um, this morning you mentioned you know this process of, of making these blind drawings and, and then also just the follow-up on the meditative aspect if it exists in your work. Well, I, I practice yoga, right? which, I don't know, is that a spiritual practice? I'm yes. Not, I'm never sure. Yeah, yes. I'm never sure. Yes. But um, I, had a, I had a moment um, doing yoga that I think relates to painting, where I, I got into the pose, and it was, it was right. It was just right. And I felt distinctly like the pose existed before me, and I just got into it. As if it was an empty shape, waiting for it. And your body conforms to it. And sometimes it's a little off, but when you get in it, it's like getting into the right shoes, like Cinderella or something. <laughs> this. Um, and the blind drawing, the thing is, I'm trying to drive less, so I'm, I'm not in that so much, but I can, I can remember what, what it was like to just. Maybe it was my my version of obsessiveness because there's not enough time. That's that's my that's my problem. So I want to fill it with with making, and making does slow down time, for sure. To the point where I actually think that I make paintings, or maybe we make paintings to replace ourselves when we're not. So I mean because. The unconscious or inspiration or imagination, it, it's kind of like it exists outside of time. I mean, that's why we go to museums, that's why we stand in front of artwork. Mm -hmm. Because there's a, there's, it's not, there's a frozenness to the moment. You know, you can return to the painting and you're, you've changed. But somehow it, it hasn't. And that's the view, the museum um, housing the, these frozen moments that persist um, and, and make you feel your own aging and, and the changing process that is, is inevitable. <coughs> so I think the, the line drawings, it's like a way of keeping up with the moments as they pass. As if you could keep drawing every, every minute of the day, um, you would be experiencing it. Right? The, the problem is not experiencing whatever's happening. Living in the past or living in the future, and to 
being a, whatever is obsessive has to do with trying to be in the moment and usually failing. But that's what we do. Well, and and that comment reminds me of each of you have said this morning or stated in, in earlier uh, other contexts that um, your your work is in some way capturing the moment in between, you know, in between um, um, something that has existed as a memory and present day, or the world between um, Earth and and sky, or um, Judith, with your work, it's this in-between world of mythology, maybe, and, and fable and reality. There's this in-between. So, and maybe that's just the way I read it. Maybe that's my dialogue with the works of art. Um, but, um, well, I guess, is that an accurate dialogue that I'm having, or am I just making that up? <laughs> well, I think of Judith's work as literally the membrane our space and light. Okay. So, is that is that right to you? That's you awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I'm thinking about necessarily, but it's pretty nice. <laughs> it's literally what the membrane of the glass is doing. Mm -hmm. You're working with light as a medium, not just glass. And if Barbara's working with light, I was thinking about the connection between mm -hmm. you know your your work and you're both working with elemental forces of life giving. Um, well, that, that's right. That's <laughs> it. Um, and, you know, when I, when I was thinking about the, um, you know, it's a really angel kind of um, notion but that duality thing, like where you're, you know, got one foot in each of, you know, two worlds um, seemingly opposites, like, you know, in the romantic movement in literature, right, that that's supposed to be uh, some wonderful kind of, um, well, T.S. Eliot's still point, right, where you are, where it's that, it's that moment between things. And I remember um, uh, things, uh, 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 you know, for instance, um, people, uh, I, I, I don't want to say my therapist, but I'm just going to say, so my therapist would say things like, um, uh, stress, right? You, you think of it being associated with, you know, with hectic or depression or all of the hectic times or whatever. But you can equally get stress from from uh, uh, incredible, awesome, you know, great things. That, that the duality of them um, uh, they, they exist side by side. So, to me, like one of the questions I think you, that you had in here, just talking about the threatening beauty, the title. I just think that. Um, to me, that's the one thing that I was thinking about beauty, is that uh, you, you can't really have it without the other side. I mean, that's the great thing. So, um, uh, it's, a, it's a balance. It makes sense to me in terms of the way the world works. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not particularly religious, or rather I'm omni-religious, but I think that that is such a prevalent uh, human way to see things. I think the uh, duality or the tension I, I was most interested in is in maybe uh, sort of human emotional states going from sort of despair to hope or something like that. To be honest with you, I don't think about myths or fables at all. I, uh, uh, I do things that are taken from myths and fables without reading about them. I, said, you know, I did a whole thing on Icarus yeah. without even knowing that. You know, and and, and the, leave that to us to I was really obsessed with the Minotaur because I thought he was a really good guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was a good guy in mind, but I am interested in transitional sort of emotional states. And um, one thing I people sometimes ask me about like the weird way I draw faces and human figures, and because um, I can't. Stop doing them that way, even though I've been trying for 50 years to stop. Um, but I can I can do them differently, but then I change them back because they look wrong. So, and I think uh, that often the eyes have one expression and the mouth has another one. So, like the eyes are sad, but the mouth is happy. 
or you know th things like that. And I, I just think that sort of big emotional uh, states that cover sort of a wide spectrum are interesting. And I want to say that I think it's important to think about um, beauty and prettiness as words and abstractions. And the problem with abstract words is that they aren't tied to a firm referent in this world. You can't say this is a beauty and forever this will be the definition because it isn't an object. And, um, <clears throat> but it is handy to make a big difference, a big distinction between prettiness and beauty because prettiness, I think, is something that you could quantify with a, a ruler or a, you know something that would measure a Fibonacci sequence or a golden spiral or symmetry or luminosity, something like that. Those are things that are attractive to all humans. And that doesn't mean that they, uh, they get sort of associated, associated with goodness because they're attractive. And the opposite of attraction is repulsion, which we have for a biological purpose to keep us from poisoning ourselves, etc. So <clears throat> there is, I think, I would say that beauty is something much more complex than Barbara, when you were just saying now about that, beauty is all, always contains its opposite in order to be worthy of, of, a, of a name. Like, like the night sky, I think we can say it's absolute, absolutely beautiful, but there's terror in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about that transitional um, space or idea that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm in the car ride to lunch. The four women in the car realize that we all have this fantasy about seeing tornadoes mm -hmm. and dream about them. <laughs> <laughs> and long to see them and never seen them except in the Wizard of Oz. Um, but extreme weather is so awe-inspiring because of the scale of it and the relation to our bodies. But a transition from that beauty, that absolute beauty and terror, to what we make, I don't know about that. It makes me think, okay, what, what, you know, fireworks, right? That's beautiful, but is it art? I mean, that, that in-between state of something that's made that emulates a, a natural process is, is um, that's a transition I'm, I'm interested in. And I think we kind of strive for that when, when we make things, to, to flirt with nature, like April Gordon, does it one-to-one -one, right, representation? She tries to paint those things how they look. Mm -hmm. And the, the rest of us, um, well, I'll speak for myself, are more like clawing and, <laughs> you know, like clawing my way there with uh, very clumsy tools, but more from the point of view of the body in relation to what we're seeing, rather than some optical reality that I'm trying to reproduce. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think, um, I just think that kind of the natural, natural, <laughs> the natural <laughs> phenomenon that you were talking about. Uh, I mean, I had a, a, an art teacher when I was young who basically said, you know, you can't compete with nature. And I, it really stuck with me because I just feel like those, those experiences that put me in that situation is so, it is so terrifying and so great and so awesome um, that I don't really, I don't, I don't want to have to put art in there with it because I just feel like it can't compete. How, how could anything that I make ever compete with a real sunset or a real night sky? I mean, those things are, you know, enormous, and I, and, and I think, so for me, there, there are things that are influential, but it's not like, um, I, at least again, speaking for myself, that I'm trying to recreate um, something that's not, um, it's not possible, really, yeah. So the realm of the imagination, it's constructive. I just realized something about the Wizard of Oz. It starts with a tornado, but it ends with that, that what is the balloon, the hot air balloon, which is kind of like a, like a small version of, of the demo of heaven, right? It's like a constructed 
piece of sky. So that, those are the bookends to, to that story. I haven't thought about Wizard of Oz in a long time, so it sounds like. There's a fairy tale. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to ask about enchantment. I keep waiting for that. Enchantment. Can you talk about enchantment? Let's talk about well, enchantment. Well, just accidentally, the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, no, I mean, it is, it, it is a good segue. All right, enchantment. The idea of, um, well, we're going to talk about fact and fiction. And enchantment will be part of that. Um, the exhibition, as you know, examines the paradox of enchantment and how it is equally delight and delusion in the way that fiction implies fantasy and deceit. Um, and I want to unpack that for just a minute to lay the groundwork for a question because there's a lot there. We're talking about paradox of enchantment, delight, delusion, and fiction implying fantasy and deceit. So, enchantment can mean both a feeling of great pleasure or delight. It can also be the state of being under a spell. And in fact, the origin of enchantment comes from a, a, around a, a circa 1300 um, French word that has to do with magic. And then if we think about fiction, for the, I know there are several writers in the audience, um, novelists can reveal great truths about the human condition, so can poets, filmmakers, playwrights, all writers. Writers of fiction use fact to make their work believable. They do research to create authentic settings into which we enter. They use detail to make us see, to suspend our disbelief, to persuade us. Writers of fiction use certain tools to reveal reveal truths and help suspend disbelief. They place characters in scenes and settings, have them speak to each other in believable dialogue, reveal limited points of view, and move through time over conflict toward resolution. And then kind of included in that is scholars have demonstrated that there is a fictive nature to our memory, meaning that the things we remember are not necessarily the way they were. So this makes the uh, writing form of memoir problematic because reality and imagination blur. So with all that in mind, with, with just to sort the groundwork for fact and fiction, with regard to your work as a visual artist, are you creating delight, delusion, deception, memoir, or some combination? Okay, I'll go. What did you say? I said, okay, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> um, you were ready. You're like, I want that question. I have no interest in fact. Uh, I've never seen nature before. Uh, everything that's natural in my pieces I made up. Um, uh, you know, I guess the first thing I thought of when, when you said what you said was the quote by Picasso that art is a lie that tells the truth. I think, and I guess it's really comforting that neurologists are going to confirm that by, by telling us that everything that we remember is basically a lie. So, so that's that's the good news. Um, you know, uh, I don't think I really have anything else to say on this, but I think that, um, that a lot, you know, it has to sort of, it has to. The idea of delight seems sort of superficial, but uh, uh, a delusion. It sounds like uh, denial and things that we associate with like bad psychological practices. Um, but, uh, you know, just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. That's not in the Wizard of Oz, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, something you said about uh, memory being a lie uh, just triggered this um, thought. It's not quite an answer to your uh, question, but um, uh, I, I heard this really great um, thing on, I think it was Radio Lab on NPR. It was talking about um, what I translated as near-death experiences, but they didn't 
call it that, but they were talking about the mind and the body and how um, they, it's a conversation and they talk to each other. Um, I think we tend to think that you know the mind is the center of the idea, right? And that everything comes from here and it gets kind of, this is the control center. And it was basically saying that it's a two-way street and you can't, they don't really, uh, you can't really function uh, independently in a way. So um, the gist was, what happens when that, when that gets interrupted, that conversation? And they were talking about astronauts, for instance, that, you know, that are in these test things and they kind of um, pass out and they have this you know, uh, disconnect between the body and the mind, and the mind's still going. And um, a lot of them um, had this thing about wanting to turn on a light switch in the room. And um, I just started thinking that it, it's so interesting to think about trying to to remake that notion because your your apparently your your mind is just sort of set uh, uh, unmoored and it's set free and it just wants to go and grab on to to weird memories <coughs> and ideas and, and and lies and whatever and formulate this thing and I was thinking maybe that's the um, you know oh the tunnel the light at the end of the tunnel uh, metaphor that we get so much right the near death experiences that you either walk toward it or you walk away from it. I don't which is the right direction, but 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 I was thinking that it would be so interesting to try to remake that notion, which in a way is sort of trying to remake your idea of heaven, if you will. And um, so that's not a memoir. I'm trying to get back to your question here, but but I think, and it's not really fact or fiction, but I just think it's an interesting middle ground in terms of. Um, what I would be interested in in terms of my work. Uh, no, not my work, just interested in the subject. Yeah, we, we talk about things that we're interested in thinking about, but it's, it's like two parallel train tracks. This is what you do in your studio, and this is what you like to think about. And sometimes, mm -hmm. it sometimes they say, <laughs> yeah, they collide. I'm so interested in listening to them, I forgot the question. <laughs> What do, you, what do you consider your work delight, delusion, memoir? Oh, I wouldn't know. I mean, you're asking the wrong people, right? Because yeah. we're the subjects. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like trying to look at your own eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say the metaphor would be I'm uh, trying to dream awake. That's the, that's the kind of you want to get to a place, you make your work to get to a place so that you continue making your work. But, but what is that place? What level of consciousness? We don't even know what consciousness is. We don't know if what we're seeing is just so limited based on the sensory organs that we have. I mean, what? Another radio lab uh, illusion, which I'm addicted. By the way, that's my addiction. Um, that 98% of the universe is like imperceptible to us. And given our, sens our sensory um, possibilities, we just cannot perceive most of what's here. So what we're seeing is, is a tiny slice, and we're making out of that what, what we can. And so I don't know if that's a lie. It's just incomplete. And so we're kind of like catching, catching the raggedy end together when we, when we try to put together the world. And, and from the little I know um, about memory, yeah, it seems like you remake the memory every time you have it. So it's all a construction. It's like that thing I was talking about this morning. When, you know, you're building, you're, you're building your brain out of your thoughts as you as your brain grows. And so you're you're not able to. So then by the end of it, you you are the structure, and it's hard to talk about the structure because you're so excited, so I'm not sure if that's answering, but no, it, it's good. like saying there's no, there's, there's no way to answer it, but, but that's okay. But that's okay, yeah, it's just the questions are it. Yeah. Can I add one thing, of course? Um, since my work is, I try to make it 100% for my imagination if possible. I don't know, that's probably not possible, but I will say one of the things that's most strange to me is like 
Like, if I had been, you know, raised in isolation by horrible, cruel parents who only stuck flat food on the crack in the door, I don't, uh, and I hadn't had any stimulus, I don't think that you have an imagination in those circumstances. Uh, and that, if I, I compare, like, my imagination and everyone else's to, like, it's like making carrot juice. The like, carrots, like, they don't have a lot of juice in them. I, I, I don't, and I would never actually make juice. But I will say, I'm just guessing it takes an awful lot of carrots to make one cup of juice. So that, uh, sometimes when people ask me what are my influences, it's like, it's like the Oxford English Dictionary that you're going to. Everything influences me, and you can play spot the influences with my work. Um, so in order to have one thing that might be called an idea, or whatever that is, uh, a thousand million stimulus things from the outside world go in there. And then, like, one little tiny drop comes on the other end. And I need a full cup to get going. So, so that's how my imagination works. Oh, but this is so good because going back to this, this radio lab thing that I was listening to, they, you know, that they were literally saying, for instance, um, people who, who are mobile and, and or, you know, are paralyzed or something, that, that they found that literally they experienced emotion less, which I thought was just like cruel. And they didn't mean that, it, that the person was suffering necessarily, but the peak and the low of, you know, of emotion were, were uh, in other words, uh, again, this body uh, head thing that were actually um, kind of having less emotion, less. Um, Variation and intensity of emotion, which again was very healthy, but it just goes to, to, to me just saying this thing about like the more um, experience, the more information, the more stimuli, the more whatever that that uh, goes in there and it gets distilled and you get the, the carrot juice. And you get some kind of structure. Yeah. You know, some people are more juicy, some people are more, you know, like yeah, the class and the juice. <laughs> Um, well, Jim, you mentioned that everything is an influence for you. Well, paraphrasing. Um, so, a concrete question then: um, How about the for Barbara and um, Sharon? How about your influences? You mentioned Solowit this morning. Are there some other? Can you can you tell us some of your influences? Um, yes, and I. If, if you were at the um, talk this morning, I apologize because I'm just saying things over. Um, uh, Solowit was big for me because he was a kind of systems person and I think that I love the structure and uh, that it opens up into sort of play at the same time. Um, I, I particularly love um, uh, Eastern sources even though I'm not, I'm not a scholar, I don't really know much about uh, what's in Asian art history, but um, I love the art of, um, you know, I love uh, the prints of Japan, I love <coughs> Uh, lots of um, tantric and um, those little wonderful wash yantra paintings from India. I um, uh, I love this graphic designer Tadanori Yoko, who is uh, from the 60s, who's gray, he's still alive. And um, um, there's one other thing I was thinking that I, I hadn't talked about. Anyway, it'll come back to me. I'm thinking of a couple of paintings in the Metropolitan Museum. I'm thinking of a couple of paintings in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, kind of like an easy go-to place. When I first um, came to New York, I was 17. And, uh, so I transferred my loyalty from the Global Museum to, to the Met. And um, there's a Sassetta painting that I just fell in love with. It's a, it's a panel painting. It's about this big. And there's a procession of horses. Do you know it? Yeah. <laughs> There's a procession of horses um, with riders, and there are two hills that cross, so there's this wonderful um, kind of crotch shape. You know, it's very female. It's kind of like a baseball diamond, actually. <laughs> 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 um, and there's a golden star in the, in the sky, and it's just such a long it's, it's just a little piece that is not too proud of itself, it's not too showy, but anyway, I, I just was drawn to it like a magnet because of the feeling of it. 
long. Um, years later, there was an exhibition of Sassetta at the Met, and it turns out that painting has, a, has another half to it, which they, they showed together at the time. And it turns out the procession of horses was actually the going downhill, and then they come, you see the whole thing, it's a diptych, one over the other. And on the bottom, there's the nativity scene. So these are the three kings or lovers coming to give baby Jesus the, the cool swag. Um, so, <laughs> and so it all was sort of complete, but I have to say, I like the I like the fragment because it's incomplete, and the longing I think comes from the idea that they're they're going somewhere, they're actually going down um, to the main event. But to me, often the the main event is not the beautiful part. When when Barbara this morning showed. Um, from Angelica, she didn't point to the angel's face, she pointed to the wing of the angel with these beautiful dots. So sometimes you, you see it in, in the margins. And I, I actually love that little angel with the flame coming out of the forehead. It's so beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I also just thought of something, uh, I knew what I, what I meant to say was, um, the other thing when you're talking about going to museums, you know, when I grew up, I didn't have that. I grew up in Nebraska, and we didn't have any museums. And I learned about art from, from photographs and books. And uh, people always ask me, why, are your, why is your work so kind of flat? And it's not a, a kind of modernist approach. It's because, I think it's because I learned to, to about art in, in reproductions. And in, um, so theoretically, you're missing a lot of what you know, the surface and the scale and the beauty of it in, in going to a museum. But lately, I've been thinking, eh, you know, I missed out on that. But the, the thing that um, I kind of gained is a weirdly uh, democratic feel for art. Like, everything's accessible. And everything is kind of the same size. So, you know, the ivory snake goddess, which is this big, is so, you know, and and uh, you know, I just thought it was eight feet tall. I don't know why I thought that because it's ivory. But you know, uh, um, there's something I think for to be said for the population um, that that loves art and comes through it through that weird. Um, you know, James Castle. Oh yeah, yeah. We need a Kickstarter campaign. Museums for Iowa now. <laughs> <laughs> Nebraska. Nebraska. <laughs> Iowa, maybe too. Um, okay, it, at some point, India was mentioned. I, actually, I think Barbara, you mentioned it. But so, but I do want to talk about sharing your experience in India. Um, and in general, the whole idea of um, new directions in your work and, and new challenges that, that uh, each of you have taken on. Um, so, Sharon, you received the full right to travel to India in 2013 and 2014. Um, and I know, that I read that you had been scheming to get there for a while. So, um, why, why did you want to go? And um, tell us a little bit about how that experience has impacted your recent work. Well, in the Boston Museum, there's a set of paintings called Raghavala paintings that are Indian miniatures, and it's a set. And they each um, are named after ragas, which are musical uh, pieces composed for certain times of day. And supposedly, um, each raga has an emotion to it. And the emotion comes from a, a set of uh, a set of notes. It's not it's not really a melody. It, it's, a, it's a set of chords, and the um, the musician um, improvises. So these ragas are uh, then translated by poets into, um, into visual form by, by painters. And so the idea that the sets of colors have corresponded with musical notes and meaning and absolutely fit into these emotions um, just really intrigued me. I mean, I couldn't see it. I could, who could prove you know, that this is um, unrequited love colors in this configuration and that, that one is about jealousy, for instance. They're all about love. They're all love things. So I thought I have to, I have to go 
know, I have to, I have to know more about this. And, but little did I know that the museums in India are not what they are here. Um, so I, I went with a really highfalutin kind of um, proposal, which you kind of have to do for the Fulbright. It was the hardest application in my entire life. Um, but I got there, I wanted to study, um, to see, and oh, also these paintings are gendered. Um, they come in sets of like five men, fathers with their wives. And so there's like the main, the main raga is a, is a male painting, and then <laughs> he has five wives, and that you see the, the man names, and they're five paintings. So I just thought, what an interesting sort of conceit. What is what structure? Like, is there anything to it? So I went there, you know, as a fake scholar. Uh, but <laughs> I, I found out, and these are made in imperial um, situations. So, um, you know, the elegant folios. So I get there and I real, I, I discover I'm a primitive. I, I really connected with the faux part, with the story scrolls that were painted by um, uh, itinerant artists um, who, you know, knocked on doors to try to um, paint pictures of the dead people's stories and, um, you know, like an amazing faux art traditions there. And just you know, seeing the textiles and, and, and looking at silk saris hanging everywhere, and just feeling like there, there, there's so much detail that is held there, just like those miniature paintings. These strict structures that can hold amazing, voluptuous, um, infinite detail. So that's what I got from the throat. Painting the compositional idea, but um, talk about beauty. I mean, that's when I felt like this piece of silk right here hanging above my head. That's beautiful. If I could just paint like the one flower that is brighter there, that would be enough for a, a painting or a whole body of work or maybe even like that. So <laughs> sometimes we measure ourselves against. It. Are, are you working on a new body of work that reflects that time? Um, years later. Well, yes, because or you're I'm always working on one. Yeah, it's like Judith said. said. It's like we're, you know, it's all just like pour it in your pour it in your eyeballs. And, um, but I did I did buy um, paper, so people still paint um, Indian miniatures there, mm -hmm. but they paint they paint them on old paper. So new paintings on and, um, and you can buy it if you find the right, you know, paper dealer with the right girl in the bag. And, um, so I think I I love the paper and um, yeah, and I love the idea of the, of the tantric paintings that um, Robert knows a lot about. They're, they're made for the purpose. They're these little kind of targets for people to put up and meditate, you know, with. But then these paintings wear out. And they just get tossed, and the painter just has to make another one. It's, it's a it's a useful art form, but it's it's as if the image sort of migrates from one page to the next, and it's a further elaboration. So I feel like I could just like catch the wave of that, and you know continue to make in that in that spirit. And then I think that making work about it. Okay. Yeah, no, it completely makes sense. And I can see where that notion of new drawings, new works on old <coughs> his, paper that has a history connects with your with your work perfectly because of as you said to, to us this morning that you have all of these drawings that you're doing and and it's just they find their way Behind the layers of your of your work, you're constantly kind of reworking it to some extent. Well, it's a metaphorization of yeah. memory. Like you make it physical, you cut them up and rearrange them. Right, right. So it's kind of. And um, Barbara, oh, the new work. Yeah, I've, um, um, your your most recent um, kind of. Project has been the large scale work at Mass Mocha. 
Yes, and I, I just and it's still there, there, right? Yeah. yeah, it's still there. It's been up. It, it's been up for a year, and it'll be up for another year. Or so, um, but um, she's taught. Uh, I'm. I'm. Uh, did this hundred and ten foot long uh, wall piece uh, that was actually printed on uh, wallpaper and then installed. I, I hand colored all the wallpaper. Um, the worst part was rolling it out and painting it. And the, the actual very worst part was trying to roll up um, 11 and a half feet of paper and not have it come out the, you know, you roll it and then you're off like just a millisecond of a something and you're fine, you're fine, and then at about two feet it just goes crazy. So that drove me nuts. But um, I did another, another one of those and I, um, and I, I, I really like it because of the scale and because it's it's kind of printmaking, which is where I started out. So I, I want to do that. I um, I also want to do, um, again, I said this morning that I, I really, for some reason, have become a surrealist, which I just is so weird to me. But um, you know, in Wikipedia, there are 30, 30 techniques surrealists <laughs> that have names. Some of them were invented in like 1972 and like Cubomania and bulletism. Bulletism is where you take you take paint and you shoot it out of a gun and, and then you wait and then you look at it and figure out what it, what it looks like. Um, you know, they've got protage, which I always thought was some sort of weird sexual <laughs> thing, but it's actually a where you put, you know, you put two painting, you put lots of paint down on one painting, you slap them together face to face with another painting, and you pull them apart, and then this is a Max Ernst kind of thing, and then whatever's there, you, again, you look at it. So there are, um, again, I wish I could remember some of the other uh, other names, but um, uh, there are all these weird techniques that have been invented, and I thought it would be fun to make a series uh, with one technique on each painting. So that's um, another another thing. Um, but otherwise, I'm, I'm with you all, and it's just I, I have no idea. I you know, hopefully it will be a lot of good paintings. But I don't, who knows? You've got retirement coming up. I've got retirement coming up. Lots of lots of time. Um, and Judith, I, you're are you going to talk about the uh, work at the penitentiary in this afternoon? I am. That was some years ago. I know. Um, that was. So like, it's not new, but it was a large project. <clears throat> So it was a large project. Um, I am going to talk about it. Okay, so we won't. French won't ask me what I'm doing now because I'm not going to talk about that. I would like to know. <laughs> I'm going to out myself for the first time. I've lost interest in the human figure, uh, at least temporarily. I, you know, I just uh, I haven't drawn a human image in like a year. I mean, I have enough backstock of violent <laughs> drawings that I could use it for the rest of my life. But I've, no, I just want to draw flowers. And that's the truth. All those backgrounds, they're not backgrounds anymore. Oh. They're the foreground now. Nice. Oh, wow, well, of course. Okay, and I, um, Deanna gave me the wave, which means I only have time for one more question. So, um, and then I'm hoping we have a couple, we can have a couple from the audience. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question. Um, so, Barbara, I don't know if you, ever associated yourself with the pattern and um, decorative decoration movement or not, and especially since you were born in 1994. <laughs> you, were not, you were not part of that movement. I hope this is, you know, like put out there in the world. I know. <laughs> She's <laughs> already retired. I know. She's a child prodigy. You are. She's retired. <laughs> <child. laughs> <You are. laughs> um, but, but just for, for those of you uh, in the audience who are not familiar with the pattern and Decoration movement. It was in the late 60s and 70s. Um, both patterns were used, were used craft uh, ornament that was um, kind of typically uh, of the female um, um, domain, um, used to large large scale usually. Um, so one of the leaders of that group was Marianne Shapiro, who of course is also a leader of more feminist art movement. So I, my question is going to be for all of you then is um, how has being a woman influenced, altered, challenged, or helped you to author your journey as an artist? Oh, 
I was all ready for the PMD question. Wrong. Yeah. You can answer PMD. Okay. Um, and then I'll give that time. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the pattern and decoration question. Um, you know, I love love that work, and I felt like it, um, you know, elevated um, uh, things that were considered women's work. You know, uh, fabric design and fiber arts and ceramics and you know a lot of things that you know were in the realm of either craft or women's so-called women's work. Um, you know, it was really brought up deliberately so, and, it, and the whole feminist thing I thought was was just great. The other side of the P and D um, question for me is that um, what I loved is that it, it opened up. Um, I mean, sure, somebody like Picasso was very interested, let's say, in you know, you know, African masks, and there, you know, there was a whole lot of, uh, you know, historically, a lot of people always interested in other uh, cultures. But I feel like the P and D time. What was nice is that um, there was an openness to um, other cultures in a different way, and um, for me, that was really great. So that suddenly, you know, you could be looking at. Um, uh, Asian art or African art or um, Australian art or Aboriginal art or that it, it just sort of uh, kind of op opened up many more possibilities. So that was one thing that I really loved about that particular time. Um, having always been a woman, I can't compare it to what it's like to be a man. But I will say that not only did I insist on being a woman, I also decided to work in glass and live in Philadelphia, while at the same time coveting New York art world success. So I don't know what's my problem because that's Excuse not. Excuse me, who has a Guggenheim here? Yeah. Well, I will say that all those things that seemed like disadvantages turned out to not be so. So just believe in yourself turns out to be the real superpower. Um, and uh, I love pattern and decoration. That's a, I don't even know what to say except for love, love, love. Sharon, your turn. Um, well, my parents were both artists. My mother con consistently put herself in love, my father is an artist. So I grew up like with a real gendered like framework. Um, but I didn't think really that they had anything to do with my behavior. And then I went to New York, I was 17. And um, there were all kinds of things going on. Hans Hacke was my first sculpture teacher. Cecile Abish was teaching there. Feminist art was going strong. Mary Shapiro. Um, minimalism was happening. I mean, it was such a crossroads. The, the Abex guys were still alive and teaching in the painting department at Cooper. So it, it just seemed like you could be any kind of artist um, that you wanted to be. But now that I, I'm older, I see it a little bit differently. I'm, I'm very happy for the non-binary movement that my students and my 22-year-old son are you know, bringing to, to the foreground. And, I, and I'm very curious about my, my frame of reference, which has been so gendered. You know? all this time. So it's pretty interesting to think outside of the, those terms. Um, yeah. um, you, you know, I think um, just uh, as, a, as a tangent, um, people have said to me, oh, in, in New York, just it just seems like there's so many older women that are coming out of, you know, like, what, what, where did all these older women artists come from? <laughs> Isn't that great? And of course I think it's great. <laughs> But, but to me, it's kind of like, I was thinking it's because, I mean, maybe this is really obvious, but I was thinking it's because, um, I, this is my theory, completely unfounded, is that, that, that a, a lot of women artists, it's just that you, you're, you're used to just doing it regardless of the rewards. So, so maybe if you're a young 25-year-old guy and you have great success and then the success falls off or something or it doesn't happen, you, you may go do something else that gives you that great success. Where I think a lot of um, women that I know, older women that I know, it's just sort of like, yep, steady, steady, just do it, do it, you know, and then it's sort of like, oh, you know, you're, you're Kathy Bradford, and what is she in her 70s now? She's just so amazing and great. 
and, uh, and but she's been making art all along, all the time, and um, uh, so I'm, I guess I'm making a judgment here, but I just think, uh, um, I don't know what I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Do, do we have any questions from, uh, yeah? So I've only heard the word once from one of you in the panel, but I think a lot of what you've been speaking to the, the whole time is this idea of intensity or having to push into something. And it relates to this last question that Laura asked about being a woman. Women aren't really um, encouraged to be intense. And yet, you've kept going with your art. You have um, really pushed the boundaries of this idea of mortality and just pushing for things to happen. So can you kind of speak to like what intensity or where you found that intensity and how that's come with you in your art? Uh, as the genetics. <laughs> Another red <radio> arrow <laughs> <man. laughs> Okay, so you know how the idea of evolution is that we evolve very slowly and um, but then you hear about you know, environmental, the, the, the nature nurture of divide. So it turns out that our experiences do affect our genes um, over the, the meat of the gene. There's something, if they're, if they're a biologist in the audience, please forgive me. Um, anyway, so our experiences, especially traumas, are registered in our genes, and therefore we can pass them on to the next generation and the next generation. And so I was so pleased to hear that this was a scientific thing because I felt that my grandparents and their parents, who were who were artists, had tra trauma, you know, in, in their in their lives and their as in their lives, but also in their artistic lives. And my grandmother, you know, she she couldn't be an artist. So um, I've had the sense recently that I'm sort of like channeling their energy. In a way, so I feel like it's intergenerational. And does that answer your question at all? I don't know. Is that intensity? It feels like energy. Energy is intensity. So that's that's my little story. I just I wanted to, if you don't mind. No. I feel so strongly that I'm also channeling the energy of my grandmothers. Um, I come from an intense, intense family, especially of women. I will say that I was always such a dork in school. I never had a chance of fitting in. I know I knew that like I was doomed when like the stoner crowd wouldn't have me. So I, at some point, I just decided there's nothing to lose in being who I am because clearly there's no alternative, really. So I couldn't. I just couldn't fit in. So I didn't bother trying after a while. This is what you get. <laughs> well, let me just say, I want to grow up to be Judith. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, if, uh, I, I actually love that question because I feel like I have no intensity. Because in my, in my family, you know, one, one is not supposed to have intensity. So one, one should be demure and have no intensity. So I, I, want, I want to be you. <laughs> That's really interesting because when you when you look at at the work, it is intense. You're, I'm, I'm of your, I mean, all of your works have an intensity to them, but that is interesting. I only heard the word intense used as a pejorative recently by my boyfriend, no less, who was talking about me. Um, <laughs> full throttle, but I will say, I, I was always raised to believe that to be an intense person was a good thing. So I just did fail to, <laughs> I failed to learn the other lesson. This is why I'm in therapy. <laughs> I too am in therapy. Any advice for your younger selves like, um, that you learn right now that you would want to travel when you're younger? 
You know, um, no, I don't have <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, Does your therapist? <laughs> Is 